Welcome to today's episode of Great Gardens. In today's episode, we're going to talk about perennials and specifically perennial garden design. Why people want perennial gardens, the maintenance aspects of it, all the different options for plants. We're going to talk to Lori Sullivan first, who is a perennial design expert. And then we're going to go talk to Sam Hoffman, who's going to show us how we can go the economical route and divide some perennials certain times of the year. So let's start off by going and seeing Lori Sullivan. Lori! Hi, Peter. How are you today? Good. How good. are you doing? Good. Very good. Good. So we're talking about perennials, your favorite yes. subject. I love perennials. And I just want to talk real general for our viewers in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Take a few minutes and tell mm -hmm. us why somebody wants to do a perennial garden. Perennials are great because they add a lot of extra interest to your garden, your yard. It extends bloom time, not necessarily because of the length of bloom of the perennial themselves because a lot of them are a little bit shorter in bloom. Yep. But what they do do is you, you can have different flowering times for perennials. So you can design a perennial garden so that there's something flowering all the time. All the time. And Perennial gardens can be all perennials, or they can be perennials kind of in front of the shrubs in the back, kind of like a border perennial right. garden. Mixed sure border. Requests for both types. Yeah. Do most people just want a plain perennial garden because they just love the idea of something always being in bloom? Some people do. They're looking for all perennials. They love the flowers. They don't mind that there is a little bit of maintenance involved with plants, yep. you know, with the perennials. Yeah, let's talk about maintenance. That's sure. something. I think there's a perception out there that perennial gardens are more maintenance. Is that true? Sometimes, but we like to know when a customer comes in how much time they have for gardening, how much they right. really like to be out there playing because there are some perennials that really don't require a lot of work. Maybe it's just a little bit of deadheading or once a year you'd cut it back. Yep, yep. We have a nepeta over here yep. um, that just blooms like crazy. It starts in this time of year and it blooms all the way until the first frost. Now if a customer just wants to leave it like this, they only have to cut it back once a year. Right. But if they want to have a tidier looking plant, they'd cut it back halfway mid-season. Right, right. And then it would flush back out again. So there are right. some that you can choose based on questions that we would ask the customer Okay. that would take less maintenance. I got it. Something for everybody. Right. How about soils for perennial gardens? The perennial gardens generally need to have good deep soils just like shrubs do and you want to have healthy soils equal healthy plants? Healthy soils equal healthy plants but there are also a lot of perennials that can take soil that, that really isn't that great. We have okay. sedums that are rock yep. garden plants, yep. achilleas. Yep. Uh, there, are, there are a number of plants All over that, the board there. that absolutely can take. So again, it's what the take. conditions are, what the customer wants. And it's a good thing to consider the, the um, cultural requirements of a plant right. to know uh, what they need. Well, here's another one, deer. Yeah. Yeah. Are perennial gardens more deer resistant or it's the same type? They probably would be because they die down in the winter and the deer aren't going to get them as much in the winter, right? Well, that's right, but they will actually come into your yard to eat hosta. They hosta. love hosta. Even so as that, it's coming up in the spring? Even as the, it's coming up in the spring. So you've got to watch out for hosta. Well, there's all different types of perennial gardens. Now, we'll, let's talk about the most important factor, which is shade versus sun. I mean, mm -hmm. that's where you often start, right. I would think, in your design process. Right. And we've put together a few carts around here. This is an example of a cart full of shade-loving perennials, right? That's right. Now, now, shade, is this full shade or you want some sun still? Well, it all depends on the plant. If okay. you have a, a deep, deep shade, there are perennials to suit that. But if you have um, areas that, that have some partial shade, then we can, we can find plants for, plants that, for that too. So let's talk about these choices sure. that we put together here. What do we have? I know these are hostas, many different types, right? Many colors, and, and part of the joys of perennial designing is that you can find anything that you need um, color-wise. We have this wonderful painted fern mm -hmm. that has a nice burgundy stem to it. Mm -hmm. And look at the difference when you see that plant there by itself, mm -hmm. and now you put this wonderful oh, yeah. purple heuchera next to it. So it's not all about the flowers. It it's about the foliage. It isn't about, no, and people get sometimes come in and they're sad and they say, well, I only have shade. And I say, you only have shade. Look at all yeah. these wonderful plants that you can do. Huge selection for the shade. Huge selection. And actually, a fern can take some sun too, I happen to know, right? Yes, it can take a little bit of sun. This one doesn't like it as well. Oh, okay. But um, some of them do. Keeps its color better in the shade that you see here. Right. But we have a Stilbys. This mm -hmm. one is called Key West and it has this wonderful burgundy hue to it. So you can take 
a little burgundy, pull it away from right. this heuchera, right. and then it ties these three plants in together. Right. right. And this wonderful Solomon seal. Yeah. This also has a little bit of a burgundy stem. And so what I've done together by pulling all of these plants has gotten a lot of different textures, a lot yeah. of different leaf shapes and sizes, and we haven't even talked about flowers right, yet. Right, right. And you already right. have this wonderful and, and, and the height, grouping. the height difference too. That's we haven't true. talked about so much. That's and this true. grass right here is a is a variegated kind of a, a new a newer variety grass right. here. Right. This a white. is a hakoni grass, hakoni and we grass. have um, Japanese hakoni grass, and yep. it it a forest grass, and we have a yellow one, a wonderful chartreuse one that was actually the perennial plant of the year a few years ago. And this will kind of form a mat as it gets it older, will, right? It will. A wonderful Solid. fountain. And yep. this is a, a new one called Fabuki, which is actually Japanese for snowstorm. I see. So, so this would be kind of a lower-lying plant, maybe that goes more toward the front. Fluffs over this, a rock in the shade. And other things would stick up behind it. So it's all yep. about the, um, in, within the shade area, the different heights, in addition to foliage color, flower color. There, there are lots of things to be concerned, not concerned yep. about, but to consider. The choices are the main thing I'm the, concerned the, about. There's so many. The choices <laughs> are, and, and you do want to figure out um, what you're looking for, what the customer is trying to achieve with yeah. their garden. Do, do many customers come in and they love that idea of the maroon texture because that's their favorite color? Absolutely, yeah. the, but then there's always people that come in and say, I can't, you know, no burgundy leaves. Yeah. I, goes, goes all different it, directions, all I'm different sure. directions. Yep. Here's a popular plant. Now we're going to move away from the shade, and this is more for the sun. Right. But they can take some shade through the day lily. Yes. And this time of year you won't see these beautiful flowers, but that's what they look like, so it's important to from a customer point of view, they got to block out what they see that might look real good now and be in flower and consider what will look real good later on. That's good, and we, and we always have to, to remind customers, too, that uh, to think about what's going to be blooming later on and how it will impact what's next to it. Right, right. You know, because sometimes a, a foliage will look great, but then the, the flower is a, a bright pink that, that wouldn't match yeah. what's next to it. Right, so right. it's a bit like putting together a puzzle when right. you're designing a perennial garden. Boy, it's not easy sometimes. It's but fun. The daylilies are just a huge category, and uh, how any, many different colors? Just any color any of the color. rainbow. We yeah. have some wonderful, we have a brand new one this year called Kansas Kitten, which is this fabulous hot purple oh, yeah. with a darker purple center that will be a I'll lot of fun. to check that one out. And then we move over to here and we see grasses. Yep. I love grasses, and grasses to me are the ultimate contrast plant and, and year-round interest, too. Mm -hmm. um, we put them together so that you can see the smaller one, the medium one, and the larger one. That's typically how you see them planted in the landscape? It is, and sometimes people mix them in you know, just as a, another plant to yep. add a little bit of structure to the back of a perennial garden. But some people have all grass gardens, and there are just so many numbers. You yeah. Know, I mean, look at the difference really. here. You've got this variegated yellow foliage with the blue. I think that looks really neat. It looks great. And this is a Calamagrostis that's going to get to be about four or five feet. So this time of year, it is a little deceiving. So when you yeah, see this short read little the labels. plant. You do <laughs> have to know, yeah, read the labels. And all of the labels here in the pot give you all the specifics for cultural requirements and zones, yeah, yeah. hardiness level and heights. Yeah. I think grasses are a great choice. And then yeah. we move over to, what do we have here? We've got a whole bunch of different things, but are these generally sun plants on this card? These are generally sun plants. And what I've put together here are actually some of the really uh, tough, hardy plants. And it's always important because sometimes you get uh, distracted by all of the new cultivars out you there. You want some of the old standbys. You want some of the old standbys that you know are always going to come back and the Perennial Plant Association has a Perennial Plant of the Year each year and they choose them based on level of maintenance, color, year-round interest yep. and so yep. this year this is Amsonia hubrechtii mm -hmm. and this is the Perennial Plant of the Year for 2011. Oh, now it's a light off blue or is it a white? It Can't tell is. It's a light blue and it's a star flower. It's mm -hmm. a, and um, what, this looks tiny, but it's going to get to be a three foot mound and it has this great texture which is easy to combine with anything. And it comes up two anything. or three feet as well? Two or three feet as yeah. well. And then in the fall, this turns a beautiful butter yellow. Okay. So it just it's, it, it's a great plant to so add. So it's a two, it looks, two season interest plant at least. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then what do you have? I love peonies. I mean, talk about just like the daylilies, all the selection there. It's what color do you like, right? Singles, doubles, mid, early, early, mid, late season okay. plants. Okay. Different What's colors. A, I didn't realize there's a long range in bloom time with the peonies. Yeah, this time of year into June, toward okay. the end of June. Okay. 
This is a nice color right that here. That is. And cool I always thing. like how when, when it's in bud, it looks one color. When it opens up, it looks another. Mm -hmm. So you have, even within the bloom time, different looks. And some of them have these wonderful sepals, like this one in here. It's tucked in. Oh, so yeah. once that starts to open, you have that other beautiful yeah. color that you could tie in. Maybe another yellow yep. in the landscape right next to it. And this is interesting. These are all different sedums right here, right? Correct. And sedums are a drought tolerant? They are a drought tolerant Kind of like plant. cactuses of the northeast, if you will. Yes, and yeah. they bloom in late, you know, late summer, early fall. Look at this great one. This has blue, green, and then this sort of purple on the edge. Mm -hmm. So that's another one that you could tie together with a burgundy leaf plant that would really pop next to it. Right. And it's important to tell the viewers when, when we say drought tolerant, that doesn't mean they that you can't water them. You got to get them established. You have to get them established. But then they can withstand then, some dry conditions. They yeah. do. So these they you'll do. see in drier areas, rockier areas, poor soil, right. kind of like alpine garden look. Exactly. Through. Yep. Exactly. And what are the other two that you have? And here? so this one is Baptisia australis, and this is a great plant um, because it, it it looks small right now, obviously, but it's mm -hmm. it's quite a good plant for adding structure to the garden. Okay. Because it's going to be about three feet tall, a nice broad. Uh, plant vase shaped. Yeah, it yeah. has a beautiful blue purple flower. It's called mm -hmm. false indigo. Oh yeah. Blue purple flower that comes up in May and then once the flowers die back you can pretty much prune it and it looks like a shrub in the back of your oh, perennial yeah, garden. Yeah, so it really adds yep. some good structure to it. And then we talked about the nepeta earlier which is cat mint. Cat mint, right. right. Cats will like to eat that. Well they will lie in it. <laughs> They, they will do like it. It's not the same thing as catnip, but it, it definitely. And uh, then your last card over like here, it. again, more sun loving. More sun loving plants. What I wanted to highlight here are how how important it is to have some different flower shapes in the okay. garden. So you have this great allium, this globe master, <coughs> yeah. next to a salvius, um, the May night. May night. Okay. And then this adding this nice fuzzy texture of an achillea, achillea. which is going to be a yellow flower right, a little right. bit and later. They kind of go, they're, they're kind of a, uh, a wispy look, look to it, right? Right, a flat Rounded. umble. Umble, and, there yep, you go. Yep. And I then like this these. is a euphorbia, okay. which is just barely a flower. These really are almost like bracts. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's right. So and they turn into leaves after they bloom? Is that yeah, what happens? Yeah, it, it all just sort of disappears. Yeah. But it gets to be a nice looking plant. And then this low little um, perennial geranium. Geraniums. Isn't this great? This wonderful leaf next yeah. to all of these other ones. It really just, they work together nicely. And so what you'd want to do when we look to, to design a perennial garden is that you want to take a combination that you really like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then either repeat it Exactly, or mm -hmm. just in theory, you know, just color-wise, make sure that you have a bright purple down the line so that you right. have unity right. throughout your bed. Right, either or. Right. Okay, well, Lori, thank you very much for the education on perennial garden design. You're we'll welcome. See you next I enjoyed time. it. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. That was a lot of good information. Next, we're going to go see Ann Wells for Did You Know? I thought I'd, in this segment, talk about mulching perennials. Um, mulching for a perennial bed is just like any mulching concept. You use mulches to moderate soil temperature, to moderate soil moisture, and to suppress weeds. There are a few special considerations when you're talking about both the materials and the technique for mulching in perennial beds. Um, basically, you need to work at about a one inch layer. You don't need to go deeper, which you might do with shrubs. For perennial beds, you keep it shallower. Uh, you need to make sure, just like for shrub beds, that you're not touching any of the stems. In particular, in perennial gardens, stay away from irises. Don't put anything over those rhizomes. And for peonies, stay away from the eyes. Just don't put any mulch over those eyes. You'll have a much better result. Both of these plants uh, resent having that kind of trapped moisture. Um, they need better drainage than that and more air circulation. So stay away from the crowns of peonies and stay away from iris rhizomes. The other big difference is that when you're working in a perennial bed, you often need to till in the mulch. It gets in the way. You're moving plants around, you're dividing them, you're making different design decisions, or maybe you chose a plant that just didn't work out that well. So unlike a shrub bed where you can rake that mulch aside and you know get a big working area, in the close confines of a perennial bed, best to use a mulch that you can till in to the soil 
And if you can, get extra bang for your buck by added benefit of putting in organic matter into the soil. So I have here the top three, in my opinion, choices for mulches for a perennial bed. The first one I'd like to talk about is buckwheat hulls. These are the hulls that result from um, buckwheat milling, the buckwheat that we all eat, or well, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us do. And this is a very pretty um, brown color. Uh, it's a very fine mulch. It's very nice in a refined bed, um, but it's also just a terrific weed suppressant and uh, moisture control. Uh, there's a downside probably to every kind of mulch. For buckwheat hulls, you'll find they're very difficult to spread on a windy day. But the minute you water them down, just sprinkle them lightly, lightly with water, they lock up nicely and they really will stay put. So just don't spread them during the gale. You'll get very frustrated. Um, work slowly, water them down. They lock up beautifully. They retain this nice color through the season and they're very easily tilled in, returns good humus content to the soil. The next choice is cocoa shells. These two are the byproduct um, of uh, food and these are the shells that remain. You can see that it's a, a bigger texture, it's a brighter brown, it's also very aromatic. The downside on cocoa shells is that because they are aromatic you'll have within the first three four days that you put them down a few chipmunks or squirrels that kind of explore to see if there's anything good to eat in among them. Once in a while a dog will like the smell and take a bite, but this usually passes within days just because they discover there's nothing there for them. Again, these will lock up nicely once they're sprayed with a little bit of water. You can till them in. A wonderful look, a very warm brown look in your garden. And if you like chocolate for about the first week, it's a delicious way to work in the garden. The next choice, um, this is a product that's more and more available on the market. This is a compost mulch. It's not a straight compost. You can see that this is the darkest colored. It has a texture sort of in between the cocoa shell and the buckwheat hull. This is a mix of, cow of uh, composted horse manure and um, wood shreds, uh, wood shavings. So it has a very good um, texture for your garden, nice color, and uh, the horse manure, of course, uh, puts a lot of valuable nutrients in, so you don't have to hesitate about digging it in. Uh, if you're in a sort of a woodland setting where you have ferns or woodland plants like hostas, you can use bark mulches around those because it'll seem a little bit more natural if you want to, especially if you need to taper it into a shrub bed area where you already have bark mulch. But remember, you shouldn't be tilling that product into the ground. So all of these you can till in. And it's a, a terrific way to go uh, to get all of those three goals achieved. Soil temperature moderation, um, soil moisture moderation, and adding some organic matter. For these two, I want to leave you with just one last thought. We get calls every year from people who use the buckwheat and the cocoa. And they say, well, it got wet and all of a sudden it got all moldy. That is completely natural. It molds over quickly. The next dry day, that mold dies away. It's not damaging at all to your plants. It's just a natural happenstance when they're out there spread for the first time. And so while it's alarming, it passes quickly. And these are three just terrific products for your perennial gardens. If you ever have any questions, just call us. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. A lot to know about mulches, just like everything in this industry. We look forward to talking to you next time. Earlier, we had a chance to catch up with Sam Hoffman off-site. We had a local yard here, and he showed us how to divide perennials. Uh, we looked at a hosta, and we actually looked at an herb as well. So let's go see what Sam had to say. Okay, Sam, so we're here at a house where this is a hosta, we're in early spring, and it's kind of been here for a while, and you can see there's a circle with nothing in the middle. Right. And that would indicate this hosta's been here for a while. Right. And what I want to do with this is to, I want to keep some, because this is where I want the plant to be, but I want to get rid of the rest, and I'm, we're actually going to transplant by dividing this hosta up and putting it into other sections so we get multiple plants out of one. 
Excellent, because Haas is a, is a great plant to do that with because it's a easy plant to divide and cut up, and uh, so let's do it. Now, is it, before you begin, is this the right time of year to do it when the leaves are out like this? Yeah, you can do it from early spring. Usually, I, I, I like to wait till you can start to see the eyes coming up. You call the eyes when these are a little bit smaller, but to this size is great, and today's kind of a cloudy, rainy day, so it's perfect. You can do this year-round basically but if you do it early spring though they won't miss a beat and you do it now it's still early enough and you, and you as long as it's a cool damn day, day. Know, yeah okay if it was 80 degrees and sunny you might not want to do it how about other perennials in the spring that's still the best time to do most still perennials the best right? time to do most perennials okay uh, garden flocks uh, sedums uh, are easy to divide uh, day lilies uh, all are good for spring. Okay. Um, there are a few that are better to do in the fall, like peonies. Yeah. Um, but um, most of them you can do in the fall, and actually a lot of them you can do year round. Uh, but in the springtime, they they recover much quicker, and then you can enjoy them that season, okay. and they hardly miss a beat. Okay. Well, let's show how it's done. So you just kind of dig down in here. In between these plants, it's going to be a little hard. You can see it. So you really have to step on it. You kind of need a sharp spade. Yeah. And you see it? Pull that apart. I like the spade, nice straight edge. Come around, just connect, connect all the cuts. A lot of roots in there, you can tell. Hospice have a great root system, that's why it's a great garden perennial and it's very drought resistant because it's a great root system. See in the middle, it's kind of loose in there because yeah. you can see how it's thrown out. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I've cut all the way around. Now you put now a little more force on it. Yeah, see, this leaf is come out a little bit. Yep. Okay, pull this out. Just use your hands. Alright, so that's one good section right there yep. that you got. We'll put that one right there. Why don't we do three and All then right. I'll give one to my neighbor. So maybe Sounds we'll good. divide this one in half, right? Alright, okay. we can do that. Now, what, what I like to use, instead of using the spade, especially this time of year when you might damage the plants, is you get a sharp knife. Right. Now, I don't recommend yeah, uh, one from the kitchen because usually the husband or wife gets a little mad at you. I got this one at a tag sale. Okay. And uh, so then you just cut them like that. And right through these big chunks like that is no problem, huh? No problem at all. So a now you got two nice sections. Okay. Right like that with a nice sharp knife. Great. And then we just finish off by yeah fixing your hole and putting these in the ground where you want them. Yep. So right let's there. start in the back here. Okay. And again, you don't want to plant things too deep with perennials, just like a woody plant, or just right, right, where right about level, before, with yep. right level with the ground. Right with level with the ground. Okay. Get those roots down there. Quick and easy. Stick another one right there. Now is that far? Is that far enough far apart? Enough, no, that's far enough apart. Okay. Because then we'll stick one right back in here. Finish that off back in there. Okay. Stamping in a little bit. Gonna want to give that a little, you know, a good drink. Okay, we can do that after the fact. And then you got one left to give to a neighbor or a family member, or even a lot of times, uh, you know, in the springtime, um, there's plant sales going on for uh, garden clubs. So, so throw it in a pot and bring it to one of those. Exactly. Okay, great. Well, that was easy. Let's go take a look at how you can do the same thing uh, with your herb garden. Let's go walk over here and do that. So Sam, many people don't realize that uh, a lot of herbs are perennials, mm -hmm. and uh, things like uh, sage, I guess oregano can overwinter yep. in Massachusetts, and we're looking, obviously, uh, the mint took over my garden here, but we're looking at, at chives. Yep. And I've seen these chives just expand over my garden over the last five years, and I want to get rid of this now. I don't even want to transplant this. So let's demonstrate how we do that with this big hunk hunk of chives right here. Okay, basically we're going to do the same thing as we did with the uh, hosta. Just going to get, get your shovel, your spade, go right around it. And this is pretty much fully grown. And it's still okay for the plant to do it. Oh huh? yeah, chives don't miss a beat. Pull it out, shake it a little bit. I'm going to get my knife. You do just like I did with the hostage. You reach down in here. Yep. Separate this out as best you can. Mm-hmm. A little snake, little snake in there. In there. <laughs> there he goes. 
Cut those down like that. Turn it over. Cut that piece. And we're going to put these in pots. So you're making four equal size pieces? Yep. And grab these pots. All right, you lose a little bit, but that's no, yep. no big deal. All Pretty right. much put them in the, uh, we'll get rid of some of these the mint here. A little soil on the bottom there, fill that up. Okay. Dry soil. Well, these things suck out the moisture, don't they? Smell good though. You got a little mint with you. Got a little mint with your charge. Yeah. Already, nope. yeah. all ready for the big plant sale. And we can, uh, we'll have to water these, right? Yeah, definitely water them in. You're gonna need to give them a good drink so they're nice and soaked. Will they weep? I know it's a overcast day, but would they weep if it were a hotter, sunnier day? Yeah, you, you, if you put those in the shade, uh, shady side of the house and get a good water, by tomorrow they'll be standing up straight and they won't even know that they were dug. They recover quickly. No one who wants any mint? I recommend against it, actually. It seems to take <laughs> oh, over no. my garden. Well, you have to just make a little bit more mint tea in, in, in the summertime. <laughs> and there you have it. All right. Well, that was easy. Um, thank you, Sam. That was a good demonstration of how to take uh, perennials. And people don't realize that herbs are, are perennials, too, and that they can keep on multiplying those the same way they can with the regular perennial plants. The spring's the best time to do it. Absolutely, and again, you know, it's great to share with the neighbors and the family. All right, thanks, Sam. All we'll right. talk to you next time. Thanks. <music> Sam, thank you very much. I love the economical approach to gardening, and that sure is it. My neighbor loved the free hosta, and uh, it's good to know that we can take what we have in the landscape and make more of it. So this is the time of year to think about perennials. Everything's in its full glory right now. You should come on down to your local independent garden center and see this. And uh, we hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you, Ann Wells, for your segment. And thank you, Lori and Sam, again. And if you have any other topics you'd like to see us cover, send us an email. And until next time, we'll see you on Great Gardens. For the trees on our street. At my campground. We promise to not move firewood. Because the emerald ash borer beetle could be inside. You move firewood, you spread the beetle. We promise to not move firewood. Join us at stopthebeetle.info.